Good morning. It is good to be with you. Always good to be with the family of God. It is an interesting thing that we are about. God's revelation to man, the totality of his revelation to man. We know that God's desire is that all men come to him, that they repent, and that they come to him, that they might be reconciled to him forever. That has always been and will always be God's desire. And the means which he has decided to accomplish that. He gave us a book. Gene and I sometimes laugh, but it's not a happy laughter. In that so many people that we have encountered out in the world that we've tried to bring to the Lord have made this statement. Well, I just not much of a reader. Have you ever heard someone tell you that? I'm just not much of a reader. And you come back to, I understand that. And I even sympathize. But God has given us a book. This is what we have, this book. And it is a book unlike any other spanning over long periods of time, 1,400 years, written, 40-some different authors from all over, different professions. It is a book that in many ways is, is our owner's manual here under the sun, and yet it is not written like an owner's manual. Man, am I having problems with my kids. What do I, I'll go to the index and see what kind of maintenance program I need to set up the... No, it's not formatted like that. We've talked about the fact that it, it is filled with history. Our unified curriculum that we have been going through, it has mostly been the history of peoples, hasn't it? We're going through David right now, but we went through the history of, of Abraham and his son Isaac and his son Jacob and his grandson Joseph with a little little snippet of Judah in there, right? We did the history of Moses, much of it. The history of Joshua. And now we're in the history of David. And this section is going to go all the way through Elijah. And then we're going to break off into the New Testament. So history, history, history. But it's not a history book. There are many things that historically I would like to know that are not found in this book because that's not what it is. It has a different purpose. It is filled with scientific foreknowledge, yet it's not a scientific textbook. What is it? It is God's means to communicate to his creation that we may know all things that we need to know unto life and godliness, and he did it like this. Most people who have told me that they've tried to study the Bible, this is what they did. All right, I went to the store, I got a Bible, I'm going to start reading it. Chapter 1, cool, creation. Chapter 2, a little more information on creation, very interesting. Chapter 3, uh-oh, wait, talking snake? Okay, whatever. Okay, we messed up. Chapter 4, yeah, things need to be going wrong. And then the second part of chapter 4, beginning of chapter 5, they hit the genealogies and they stop. I don't understand. Why is he giving me this genealogy? It's not that kind of book. He gave us a book, but this book is to be studied. It is to be meditated upon. Like a cow with its cud is us with the word of God, constantly working it over in our mind. Seeking others to help us, to get instruction. You've heard it said, Christianity is a taught religion. Well, of course, it's a book. 
and you try to find someone who has read and studied this book so that they can help you get into it and start making it your own. Because this book, which clearly reveals everything we need to know, so many people have stumbled upon. And that stumble is an everlasting stumble into darkness. Too horrible to consider. But here it is. This book. One of the things that helps us to understand. There is a big picture, an overarching purpose to this book that when we understand it, helps us to understand the many details we find in the book. You probably know, or if you don't know, you're about to know, uh, I like to do jigsaw puzzles. They take this insanity in my head, and they slow it down, and they focus me. Okay? Well, consider a jigsaw puzzle. One of the first things I do when I get my jigsaw puzzle out is I take the picture and I tape it on the wall. Why? Because that picture, the big picture, is going to help me to understand that this bright yellow little piece is probably that sun, not that something over here. See, that big picture helps me to understand the little ones. And then as I put the little ones together, I start seeing the big picture there. And it reinforces itself. The Bible is like that. There is a big picture that once you understand, it helps you to understand the details. And yet so many of our religious friends do not understand that. And they lose themselves and have lost themselves in the details. I even know brethren who seem to be consumed with a study of the books of uh, Ezekiel, the second part of Daniel, and Revelation. And not even the first three chapters of Revelation. They seem to spend all their time in highly figurative prophecy. And they can't figure out very simple things. Now, there is profit to the study of those books. Great profit. But as you've heard me say, I don't spend a lot of my time studying 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9. Why? It's nothing but nine chapters of genealogies. Oh, so it's useless then I should throw it away. No. When you understand the big picture that God was providing Israel after the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem and all their genealogical records, who determines who can serve as a priest, who can serve as a high priest, you understand the purpose of 1 Chronicles 1-9, through 9, and it reinforces that God has always given us what we need to worship Him appropriately. Oh, it doesn't matter how you worship God. Apparently that's not the case. God spent nine chapters of his inspired, limited inspired word to give his people exactly what they needed to worship. So the big picture helps us understand those details. This morning, I would like to harp on a subject that I often harp upon, but I do so because it is one of the concepts or aspects of Christianity that our religious friends stumble over seemingly the most, and even with ourselves. And it has to do with the different dispensations or systems that God has used over time to bring mankind to Christ. Along with that subject, we're also going to talk about a related subject, that is progressive revelation. Those two put together, when you understand them, it will allow us to be able to effectively communicate this to our religious friends. But most importantly, it will allow us to properly worship our God and to properly serve Him. Let us this morning discuss these two aspects of Christianity. The dispensations and progressive revelation. <clears throat> what's the Bible all about? The Bible is the story of Jesus. There's an overarching 
theme, a big picture. The Old Testament, Jesus is coming. The Gospels, Jesus has come. The letters, Jesus is coming again. Be ready. There's the Bible. Understanding that helps us to understand what's in the Old Testament. If it's not related and pointing to Jesus, it's probably not going to be there. Well, how come he didn't go off and follow this? Where did this Melchizedek guy come from? What's his background? It's not important. Except that he's a type of the Christ to come. That's what matters. That's why it's there. Okay? So, the story of Jesus is the story of what? Our sin problem. So the Bible begins and we understand that we sinned in the beginning and, and that sin, Romans 5, 12, through our progenitor Adam, it separated us from God as sin always does. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. But God's desire is that we be reconciled. And so everything he has given us serves that purpose. So what did he say? Well, he gave a promise. He said that he would take care of the sin problem somehow through the seed of woman. But do you understand, friends, church, that it is going to be 4,000 years before he brings forth the Christ? Okay, what are we going to do in the, in the meantime? All those people lost? No. God chose dispensations to see those people to see mankind and prepare them for Christ. Here's what a dispensation actually means. And again, it becomes one of those ugly religious words, but it's just a word. It just means something. It means a system of order. That's why you'll often hear me say dispensation or system. It is a system of order, government, or organization of a nation, community, etc., especially as existing at a particular time. God had to provide for the people of that time from being expelled from the garden, had to provide a system for them to have their sin covered, to reveal himself to them, and to provide for them a law system, a, a, a target of godliness and holiness that they were to aspire to. He had to provide something until the Christ comes. And those are these dispensations, systems. And I'm going to say that there are three systems, the patriarchal, mosaic, and the Christian. Some people break it down and they come up with all kinds of other ones, seven at least. Uh, but we're going to talk about these three, okay? Progressive revelation. Now we need to talk about that. As this promise moved forward, God revealed himself more and more. The concept of progressive revelation is obvious. Who wrote the first book of the Bible? Adam, right? Because he was the first guy? No. Who? Well, Moses wrote the first five books. Moses. Moses. You're talking 3,600 years? Excuse me, 2,600 years? After the problem, now we suddenly have something in writing, and he gave us the first five books. Then over time, God revealed, inspired other writings, the writings of the prophets, the writings of the histories, until eventually we had the Old Testament. And then there's 400 years of silence. And then we have the New Testament added to it, and then it ceases. So the idea of progressive revelation is clearly there. They didn't have really anything inspired in writing that we know of. Then they had the Old Testament, which slowly grew progressively over time. And then now we have all, the full revelation. That's progressive revelation. And it's a natural thing. If you have small children, how do you explain things to them? It's so, it's so wonderful. You have a small child who is tottering over to the stove. And the stove is hot. So what do you say? Oh, child, 
Remember the laws of thermodynamics. Remember that the heat there can cause, uh, can stimulate pain receptors in your epidermis and that's going to... No. That's not what you do with a child. You say, stop! And if they keep going, what's that about? Think of the Old Testament. How did God interact with his people? Wasn't it often a... Yeah. That's how you treat a child. And yet, progressively, as they grow up, hopefully that changes, right? I don't have to worry about uh, Susie and Deirdre uh, out playing in the road, not paying attention. They understand cars. They understand that cars are bigger than they are. And they understand how that would work out. I don't have to say that anymore. But I did it one time. But now they've grown up. Progressive revelation is a natural thing. God used it. He also created nature, right? So it makes sense. Sovereignty of God. Why did God give us a book? I have lots of things I could tell you. All I can tell you is he's the creator. He chose to give us a book. That's pretty much the end of that discussion. Why would he choose successive dispensations? Isn't that ugly? Why would he uh, use systems, one added to another, to bring us to the Christ? Why didn't he just have, um, from the seed of woman will come one and bring, here's Jesus. Crushes the head, done. God chose not to. God chose to use these successive dispensations and progressive revelation to prepare mankind for Christ. Let's follow it. So the promise is made in the garden, Genesis 3.15. The promise is seed of woman is going to crush his head, but he's going to bite his heel. Okay, well that's clearly, at that time, that was clearly nothing except a promise that the sin problem was going to be overcome. How? Don't know. By what means? Seed of woman. Who's that? Everybody. So a promise is made, but it's a vague promise. And, and as you go along in the patriarchal system, what revelation did they have? We, we don't know a lot. We follow that promise along, and then in Genesis 12.3, really stronger in Genesis 22.18, that promise, seed of woman, is focused into the line of Abram. Okay, right? We're, we got that going to happen. Then it's focused in, in Isaac in chapter 26, verse 4, and then in Jacob, chapter 28, verse 14. And then later, that promise is focused even more in the line of David. We studied it not too long ago, 2 Samuel chapter 7. So the promise keeps getting focused. And what happens as the promise gets focused? There's more revelation. Because by the time you get to David, we have the first five books. We've got the Law of Moses and many of the histories and prophets. We read that at this, weren't these, the, the reign of this king, wasn't that documented in this book? Yes, apparently it was. So as the promise is focused, revelation progresses and it's expanded. They have a better picture of God than maybe those under the patriarchal system. Why? Because God took them apart uh, and, and walked with them. They saw it. With Israel, they saw it, that he must punish sin and he rewards faithfulness. It wasn't something they heard from their fathers and assumed to be true. They saw it in action. Okay? All to bring us to Christ. All to prepare us. So the image we had of God in the beginning keeps being refined. We learn more and more about his nature. Remember I've talked to you and said that when you're studying the Old Testament, always want to have three questions in your head. What is this teaching me about the nature of God? What is this teaching me about man's sin problem? And what is this teaching me about the seed promise? Why? Because that's what everything in the Old Testament is about. That revelation progressing. These things kind of step on each other, but we will do it again. Under the patriarchal system, they had the promise. The patriarchal system or dispensation was based upon the promise. 
in the garden. And that system would continue until the fulfillment of that promise. Okay? Along the way, God had given those revelation of his nature and laws by which they would conduct themselves. Now, we don't have a lot of information about those laws. The revelation hadn't progressed there yet. What we do have is our hermeneutic that we can apply to it and know that there were laws. And we can even know what some of those were. Consider Cain. Cain offered a sacrifice that was rejected. But Abel's sacrifice was accepted. So what? Is, is God just uh, uh, arbitrary? Ah, uh, that one. I pick Abel's. No. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Abel offered the sacrifice by faith. Thus, Abel had heard what he should have offered the sacrifice. That's why it was accepted. He had been told. Where does it say that? It doesn't say that. But I can deduce it. Okay? Because God said what he had done, if he continues in it, that would be sin. Well, what's Romans 5.13 say? Without law, sin is not imputed. So when Cain then rises up and kills his brother, and God accuses him of sin and banishes him, we have to know that there was a law in place. Otherwise, he would have been charged with no sin. See how that works? So that's what we have. Not as much as we'd like. But it would continue until the promise it was based upon was fulfilled. Mosaic system. As time went by, God focuses through Abraham. That's who Israel is. That's who the Jews are, the descendants of Abraham, through which that promise was going to be fulfilled. That brings us to the Mosaic system or dispensation. It was based upon the promise of Genesis 22, 18, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And it would continue until that promise was fulfilled. Okay? What's God doing? We talked about that. We got that whole Old Testament. What a picture of God we have. Very, becoming much clearer. And what about the laws? Wow, we know lots of the laws under the Mosaic system, right? 613 plus laws laid out. Who were they supposed to be? We know the kind of people they were supposed to be. Just spelled out. And then God uses histories all along the way to teach us what it looks like. This is what I've told you to do, but it's not a checklist. We don't carry a little booklet in our pocket and say, uh-oh, this guy just called me a so-and-so. Let's see, what do I do? Turn to the index to insults, and then I go down and I say, there. Nuh-uh. Care of that. No. We see that God says, don't return evil for evil. Okay, well, what does that look like? And Jesus, when they abused him, he answered them not. Like a sheep led before the... Oh. Okay. I understand. See, we put that all together, and it helps us. That brings us to us. We live in what is called in the Bible the last days. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 28, Joel said that it was in the last days that God would pour out his spirit. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, Peter said, what's happening now at Pentecost is what Joel prophesied about. This is that, the last days. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, he said that in the last days, God would establish his kingdom. That's this, these days. Uh, even Daniel 2.44 talks about God was going to establish a kingdom that would have no end. Thus, that would be the last kingdom. And that's what we live in. Hebrews 1 and verse 2. God in the past worked in various ways. Patriarchal system, mosaic system. But now in the last days, he has spoken to us through his son. This is the end. Because his son is the fulfillment of the promises. Okay? Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. I don't want you all to be in awe of my artwork. I need to sit and do it or have somebody else do it so it looks a little less like it does. But in Ephesians 2, verses 11, beginning in verse 11, 
you're going to see this picture revealed. As the great theologian R. Stewart said, every picture tells a story, don't it? Well, every story paints a picture also. And what we're about to read, you're going to find there on the screen. Verse 11, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time, before Christ, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You weren't even a part of the Mosaic system. And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. How? Watch him tie it all together. For Jesus himself is our peace. He has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Originally, we had the patriarchal system begin in the garden and go forward. And then when the promise was focused in Abram, and when eventually they received the law of Moses at Sinai, they became separate and apart people. Then we have two systems operating at the same time. We have the patriarchal system. Um, maybe Balaam was still operating under this. Uh, I believe Cornelius would have fallen under this. But the Jews and the Jews alone were under this system. The Mosaic system was not for all people to follow, just the descendants of Abraham. Why? Because through them, he was going to make his promise. And he wanted to make them distinct, separate, holy. So that the whole world could know God is still working in the universe. Here is the proof of it. Look at the blessings upon them, right? What people have such laws as this? None. And that through them, his promise to Abram might be fulfilled. But because that law was for them and them alone, it created a wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles, between those in the Mosaic and those under the patriarchal. But at the cross, in Jesus' flesh, he tore down this middle wall of separation and removed the enmity between Jew and Gentile and put them together in one body, the church, the last system, because he fulfilled the system of the patriarchal and he fulfilled the system of the Mosaic. Now we have the Christian in one body. But we're not done. Verse 16. Why did he do that? That he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. See, there's the original enmity here in the garden. Sin between God and man. These were the systems, the preparatory systems, he put in place to bring all mankind to Christ. And now that all are in Christ, Christ's cross removed that enmity. We have reconciliation. We have the forgiveness of sin. So the enmity between Jew and Gentile is done away in Christianity. And the enmity between God and man because of sin is done away. Christianity. Keep reading. Verse 17. And he came and preached peace. That's our New Testament church. To you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both, Jew and Gentile, patriarchal mosaic, have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 
I've got to stop there because time keeps on slipping. Two preparatory systems, patriarchal, mosaic, tied to promises. The one more vague, the one with less information, less revelation. The second one, clearer, with progressive revelation having occurred, but now all in Christ are one. They're done away with. We have one body, and we're reconciled to God. And what do we have? We have the perfect image of God. John 14 and 9, Jesus says, Look at me. What's God like? Look at me. What would the perfect man that you want me to aspire to be look like? Look at me. I am it. That's why half the New Testament is what? Gospels. You better look at that. That's the, the goal. That's the nature and the image of God. And then the rest is how we go about getting ourselves to heaven and helping others, how we serve. Only understanding the difference between those systems can we properly obey our system. Here's an example with regards to worship. You've probably noticed that we don't have a piana up here. You've probably noticed that I always pronounce piana that way, and I apologize. Why don't we have a piano up here? Because of progressive revelation. As John Calvin himself said, what, are we Jews? Why would we have mechanical instruments of music? Because see, that's the argument. Well, the Jews had mechanical instruments in part of their worship, Yes, they did, under the Mosaic Law, determined and defined for them under the Mosaic Law, which has been nailed to the cross, which is no longer valid. As John Calvin said, are you Jews? Well, no. Well, then why do you seek the accoutrements of the Jewish system? Progressive revelation. Are you ready? Under the patriarchal system, we have no record of, of how they worshipped other than maybe that Job 1 and verse 5 Offering sacrifice because maybe family has sinned, the, fa the father doing that, thus patriarchal. But we have no uh, revelation of did they sing, did they play, did they do a, a hoedown, we don't know. Okay. Then what do we have? Then we have the law written in stone. And what do the people do? They use externals, mechanical instruments. Okay. Then what do we have? We have the message written on our hearts, not on stone, physical things. How are we supposed to? What is our music from? With grace in our heart, right? Singing from our heart, making melody in our heart. Do you see the progression from we don't have anything to externals to the fullness? It's about the heart. Understanding this helps us to worship properly. You've probably noticed we don't do a lot of sacrificing of animals up here. Well, why not? The Jews did it. That's true. But they did it looking forward to the Christ. We partake of the Lord's Supper because we've been commanded to look back at His sacrifice. We don't offer animal sacrifice. We remember Christ's sacrifice, and we are living sacrifices, living every day, dying to self to live for Him. Do you see the progression? Like from a child to an adult? A child receives, do this, don't do that. Do this, do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that. That's how we talk to our children. What do we have in the New Testament? Grow up. Be like me. Strive to be like God. That's the adult. That's the progression. And that's where we are. Progressive revelation is fact. I hope I've made the dispensation stuff somewhat clear. But here's the challenge of progressive revelation. What I expect from Owen, hello Owen, uh, you can't see because the camera's not working, but you can hear me. What I expect from Owen is not what I expect from Deirdre. Okay? Why? Progressive revelation. She's grown up. I expect more. Well, here we are, church. We're not under the patriarchal, we're not under the mosaic, but we've received the fullness of revelation. Everything that they would love to have had. 
that even the angels desired to look into, we have at our fingertips. What are we doing with it? Luke 12, verse 48, to whom much is given, much more is expected. God expects us, and much of the New Testament message is grow up. Come on. Be at it. Applying yourself. God has done everything. Notice there's no more revelation after Christ. Why? Promise fulfilled. No more need for revelation. Thus, when the promise is fulfilled, revelation stops. Here it is. He has said and done what he wills. The only thing that remains is, what will you do with this? Will you take it into yourself and study it? Meditate upon it? Study it with others? Seek out those who, who maybe have been studying it longer and know it more and, and seek their insight? Constantly listening, constantly seeking and striving for wisdom and knowledge? You know where that path leads? I think you do. It's a narrow path, though, because it's kind of difficult. But the path is life. That's the end of that. Or are we just going to sit in, on the pews, in the premises, and just say, close enough, good enough? That's a wide path. Most people go that way. Most people don't sit in the pews, but most people go that way. Destruction is the end of that path. What will you do? This big picture hopefully helps you to see that we have been given everything we need. The question is, will we avail ourselves of it? What will you do? Are you a Christian this morning? Have you taken God up on his offer of grace and been heard the word and believed it, repented, confessed, been baptized for the mission of sin? If not, why not this morning begin that walk with him? Heed what he says. Well, the Jews didn't have to be baptized. Well, you're right. Well, the patriarchs didn't have to be baptized. Well, you're right. But we're not Jews. We're not patriarchs. This is the Christian age, the last days. And what we've been commanded to do is be baptized for the remission of sin. If you haven't done that, why not this morning? Christians, easy to begin, difficult to finish. All those stories we talked about today. David, what a beginning. The finish, eh. King Isaiah, what a beginning. Finish, eh. King Asa, eh. Moses, there was quite a stumble at the end there too, wasn't there? What about you? Don't stumble. Learn from their example. That's why we have it. Take advantage of the encouragement and help and love that we have here given to us by God to see that you finish and that you receive all that God wants to give. If there's anything we can do this morning to help you, we'd ask that you come as together we stand and sing. Hearken the loving call, obey, come for he loves you so.